Well, it's just a, a privilege, really an honor to be able to share the word today. And like Jason said, my mom and dad are on a vacation, so a few of us are going to be sharing over the ne- these next few weeks. And uh, we're starting a new series called Awesome Relationships. So it's going to be good. It's going to be good. So let me ask you this question. Have you ever felt alone? I'm sure all of us would say yes. I'm going to just share a story. I was in high school. I decided that I would go uh, up to Lordsburg to cheer on my girls' volleyball team. So me and my friends got in the car. We drove up to Lordsburg. We got in the gym. We found our seats. And uh, the game was about to start. And uh, the volleyball coach came to the stands and said, hey, is anybody willing to be a line judge? We need a line judge. And uh, me being the faithful volunteer that I am, I said, sure, I'll do it. How hard could it be? So I went down. And for those of you who don't know, in volleyball, you have a referee who stands like on a ladder at the net. And then you have two line judges, and their job is really simple. If a ball lands in, you go like that. And if a ball lands out, You go like that, okay? And so it's only if the referee can't see it do we get to make the calls. Well, anyway, the game was going on, and uh, it was going good. In fact, I didn't really have to make any calls um, until the final set. And uh, it was a really close set. The game was on the line. Whoever won this one would win the whole game. And uh, one of the girls from my school spiked the volleyball, and it came right down to the back line and I was standing on the Lordsburg side and uh, I was in position to make the call the only problem was I was not paying attention (laughs) so uh, I looked at the referee and uh, she pointed at me and all of a sudden I felt all this pressure and I'm just thinking in the stands they're telling me what to call and And I did what any guy would do in my situation. I made the call for my team. I called it in. (laughs) Um, Apparently, that was the wrong call. (laughs) Because uh, the Lordsburg players were, and I apologize if anybody played volleyball at Lordsburg High School in 2002. I'm really sorry. (laughs) Um, They were telling me that I was wrong. And uh, the stands, mostly everyone was telling me how wrong I was. But it didn't stop there. People started throwing things onto the court. I kid you not. They were throwing pennies at me. It was, and I, I didn't take it as a compliment. And it was one of those moments where I felt very alone, very isolated, and very much like the world was against me. So... Has anybody felt like that before? Like the world is against you. It's not a good feeling. And it's not a feeling we want because we were created for relationship. We need to know that we are loved and accepted. So today I'm going to talk about what I think is the most important relationship in our whole life. And that is our relationship with God. So did you know that God wants to be your friend? He desires intimacy. He desires relationship with you. And that relationship with God begins with worship. Now, God created us to be worshipers. And worship can simply be put as placing value on something. Okay? So if you don't worship God, I guarantee you, that you will be worshiping something else. If reality television is the most important thing in your life um, and you worship it, you're probably going to be a pretty drama-filled person, I'd imagine. (laughs) But God, in his great love, created us to be worshipers because when we worship him, we become like him. And do you know that's the heart of God for us to become more and more like him? The Bible says we are created in his image. He wants us to become like him. So, and by the way, the more we are like God, the more fulfilling and rewarding and satisfying every other relationship in our life will be. If you're becoming like Jesus, 
you're gonna be a pretty good spouse. You're gonna be a good brother. You're gonna be a good friend. You're gonna be a good sister. So, worship. Worship is where it begins. So what I wanna do is I just wanna take a few things that I've been learning about worship just in my, my own life and uh, share those things and then maybe give some practical ways that we can incorporate worship unto God as a congregation and individually. So my first point is this, and I have three points I want to make today. Number one is worship blesses the heart of God. One of my favorite things when I get home from work is I know I'm going to hear this word, da-da, (laughs) da-da. I've got a two-year-old and a six-year-old, and when I walk in that door, man, they beeline it over to me and hug me, and it blesses my heart. I love to hear them tell me that they love me. I soak it in. I receive it. And then I hug them back. And I tell them that I love them. And the Bible says God is a perfect father. He's a perfect father. He loves it when his children love him and bless him. He soaks it in. He receives it. And then he loves us back. So how do we bless God? And we're going to look to the scripture, and uh, I want to read Psalm 100 to you. So if we can get that up there, Psalm 100 says this. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Now, we've heard that verse a lot at church. But here's the thing. Giving thanks and praise at the end of the day is a sacrifice, isn't it? It's giving something away. It's, it's a sacrifice. Now, sometimes giving thanks and praise to God is an easy sacrifice. If you got a check for $10,000 in the mail from some random person, it would be pretty easy for you to give your thanks unto God, wouldn't it? But sometimes our sacrifice of praise is a lot harder. And believe me, there are times in my home when my kids, the last thing they want to do is hug me and tell me how great I am. <laughs> But I tell him, give me a sacrifice of praise. No, I'm just kidding. I don't. I don't, <laughs> I don't really say that. <laughs> so, you know, I recognize that today, even getting to church was a struggle. Maybe for some, you're struggling financially and you barely have enough money for gas to make it to church. Maybe your kids were fighting on the way here and you're like, what am I doing? Maybe you had a hard time waking up. Maybe you were arguing with your spouse. Maybe you got here, you dropped your kid off at kids' church, but they wouldn't let go of your neck and they're screaming for you and it's a struggle. Maybe your name keeps flashing on these screens here (laughs) saying, come get your kid, please. (laughs) I've already seen it like four times. (laughs) It's hard, isn't it? Believe me, I've been there. You get here, you sit in your seat, and it's really hard to be like all of a sudden, how great is our God? But let me tell you this. Worship can never be based off our emotions. Worship has to be based on our trust in God. And Bill Johnson, he says this, that trust is our final expression of true worship. You believe that? Trust is the core of relationship, isn't it? If we truly believe what the Bible says, that God is a good father, that he wants what's best for his children, then we offer him a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, even if it violates our reasoning. Even if everything is going wrong and it doesn't even make sense to sing the song, you are good, you are good, and you're faithful. Even if it violates your reasoning, you offer a sacrifice of praise and thanks to God because you trust him and you trust that he really does work things together for good. You know, I so remember, it's been almost 10 years now, my wife and I uh, got married and uh, our first year of marriage was difficult. (laughs) And, And one of the reasons it was difficult is because she got really sick And it was only a few weeks after we got married where she started experiencing all these medical problems and uh, it seemed like 
every week we were in the emergency room. And um, I was like, God, what in the world? Why is this happening? We're newlyweds. We're supposed to be enjoying this time. Instead, we're spending all our time in the hospital. And uh, come to find out that Danielle's kidneys weren't functioning properly. And uh, one of her kidneys had shriveled up in her body. And it was half the size that it should have been. And uh, it was only functioning at 4% is what the doctors told us. And then her other kidney was showing signs of digression. Um, so, of course, the doctor said, you're going to have to do surgery. You're going to have to take this dead organ out of her. And you're going to have to be on dialysis, you know. Um, obviously, it was a tough time in our life. And, uh, you know, we went to my uncle's house and we had a night of worship and prayer. And um, some friends and family were there. And we sang a lot of songs. And uh, we prayed a lot of prayers. But there was only one song that I remember that we sang. Because this one song shifted my perspective in my worship to God. And it was the song, Fairest Lord Jesus. And I don't know if you guys know that hymn. It's an old hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus. Says he's the ruler of the nations, he's son of God, son of man. Thee will I cherish, thee will I honor. And as we began began to sing that song, my worship and my prayers shifted from, Oh God, you gotta do something, help, why is this happening? to simply declaring who God was. I was I was just that's all I was doing now. I was just saying who he is. You're the ruler of the nations, God. You're the fairest of ten thousand. You make my woeful heart to sing. And as I did that, and as we worshiped, and as we prayed, there was an incredible peace that flooded that room, flooded my heart. And it was just this peace that I haven't experienced. And uh, after that night, a couple days later, we went to, to the doctor's, and, for the surgery consultation and uh, they had some final scans that they were going to show us so we got there and the doctor was on the phone with the lab and uh, he was just it was weird he was like saying are you sure what's going on and I'm thinking oh my gosh what's happening so he gets off the phone and he says well I need to check into this because this isn't making sense but your final test came back and they showed that both of your kidneys were perfect and functioning. Yeah, functioning at 100%. Both of her kidneys. I can't make this stuff up. I could show you images <laughs> that the doctors gave us. You know, it doesn't, a dead kidney, a shriveled up kidney in a body doesn't just grow back. It's not like Danielle just took vitamins and all of a sudden her kidneys were perfect. No, God healed her. We declared who God was and he came through. And you know what? That peace that, that we experienced that night of worship, let me tell you about peace from a world perspective, okay? Peace in a world perspective is the absence of something. Isn't that right? It's the absence of war, it's the absence of noise. It's the absence of stress. The absence of kids. <laughs> Just kidding. I love my children. Right? Peace, peace is the absence of something in a worldly perspective. But in the kingdom perspective, peace isn't the absence of something. It's the presence of somebody. Right? It's the presence of God. We could be surrounded by war still. We could be surrounded by noise and all these things. But in the presence of God, there is perfect peace that the Bible says passes all understanding. It's cool, isn't it? God wants us to live in that peace. And even in that moment, it's not like I knew Danielle was healed. I didn't know that she was all better I just knew that God was there and he was for me and that he was good and that he was faithful and that everything was going to be okay so here's the thing when we give God an offering of thanks 
and praise. We're declaring who he is. We're drawing near to him. We're entering his courts. We're entering his presence and everything's gonna be okay. He's so good. He's so kind. Sometimes like we sing, your praise will ever be on my lips. Sometimes it's easy for his praise to be on our lips. Sometimes it's not. But in, my, in that moment Daniel was healed, my worship also changed from I was saying, God, you are good by faith to then saying, God, you are good because I just witnessed it and nobody can tell me different. You are good, you know? And our perspective in worship is always gonna go between those two dynamics. We're gonna go through seasons in life. There's gonna be highs, there's gonna be lows. And sometimes our sacrifice of praise is easy. Sometimes it takes a lot of faith. But just like what we sang today, we'll be able to look back and say, never once did we ever walk alone. He was with us. You are faithful. So I, I would just challenge you on this. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe it, you've said it. But, but something troubling in your life happens. You go through a crisis and you doubt God and you say, God, you can't be good because this is happening. All you're doing when you're doubting and questioning is taking away trust in your relationship. And when you take away the trust, you're limiting God on how he can come through for you in your life. But instead, if you offer a sacrifice of praise and thanks to him and bless the Father heart of God no matter what and declare who he is and declare his promises, you are opening the door for God to minister to you and to come and work on your behalf. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's the promise of God. So just practically, real quick, this is the worship leader in me speaking now. I just want to, as a congregation, give us some tools on how we can bless God. So sometimes in our praise, we'll end a song or we'll be playing instrumentally and we'll just sing a song, a new song unto the Lord. We'll just, we'll just sing whatever is coming out of our hearts. For you guys, this isn't a time for you to check out <laughs> or to be like, oh, there's the worship team doing their own thing. What we're doing is biblical and we're inviting everyone else into it. And the psalmist says, sing to the Lord a new song, okay? So a new song isn't a song that we've been doing the past month or something. A new song is spontaneous. What is coming out of your mouth and your heart at that moment? And I realize doing that could be a very much a sacrifice for some of you. And some of you, it's not so much. But God loves to hear his children bless him. He soaks it in. So we're not recording you. <laughs> You don't have to like try to think of a song to sing to him that's gonna be number one on the Christian radio. Um, you don't have to rhyme. You don't have to sing in key. Just sing simply what's on your heart to God. Tell him how faithful he is. Tell him how loving he is. Tell him how wonderful he is. Speak those things. And we'll do it together as a congregation. Okay, so can we do that? It blesses our Father's heart. It blesses our Father's heart. And you can even practice that throughout the week. Just sing a new song unto God. Tell him what a good father he is. Tell him what a good God he is. Tell him how loving he is. My next point is this. Worship blesses God's heart. Worship activates heaven. And this is cool. I like this. I like this point. I'm gonna read a couple Bible stories. I realized in the first service that I don't have my glasses and I can't read the screens so I'm going to walk over and read it so don't think it's weird <clears throat> and I put this in your, in your notes the atmosphere changes in worship the atmosphere changes when we worship so this first story is found in 2nd Chronicles 20 and uh, many of you might have heard this story but it's so good that we should just always tell it because it just builds our faith so ready I'm going to read this story to you 2nd Chronicles 20 says this and by the way there's some big words in here and I'm just going to skip over them and in your mind you can figure out what those are <laughs> after this the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the people came to wage war against Jehoshaphat <clears throat> some people came and told Jehoshaphat a vast army is coming against you from Edom 
from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Tamar. And let's keep going. (laughs) Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard. We talked about this. Notice what Jehoshaphat is doing right now. He's not panicking. He's saying who God is. He said, Lord God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hands. No one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name, and you will cry out, we will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. Okay, do you understand what's happening so far? There's three nations coming against poor one Judah, all right? War is about to happen, and it does not look good for Judah. They're severely outnumbered. But Jehoshaphat is declaring who our God is. So we're going to skip a little bit and continue reading in that chapter. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of somebody, and the son of Jael, and the son of somebody, a Levite, and the descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground. All the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from Something and something stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. As they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. As they begin to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. Let's end it there. That's awesome, isn't it? Man, I love that story. Do you see what happened? It was worship. God sent the worshipers to the front lines. And all they did was sing and praise God. And as they did that, heaven was activated to fight on their behalf. And heaven was activated and God, it gave God permission now to declare to the nations who he is. Okay, so first, we bless God, he soaks it in, and then he declares it to the nations who he is. And Jerusalem, they won the battle. They didn't even have to do anything. They just had to stand there and watch God fight for them. And then they got to go and take all the plunder. That's what it says a little bit later in the verse. So cool. Another story, and this one's a little bit shorter. This is found in Exodus 17. I love this one too. So let's read it. 
Exodus 17 says this, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at this place and Moses said to Joshua, choose some of your men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. All right, did you get that story? There's two parts to that story, right? There's Joshua and his soldiers. They're fighting the battle. Then there's Moses, and he's on top of a hill, and he's lifting up his hands towards heaven. Now, it didn't matter how skilled the soldiers were, what kind of weaponry they had. If Moses' hands were not lifted to the throne of God, they were losing, okay? So this is important for us to understand as a church. We value worship so much. Because we could be doing a lot of ministry all over the world, fighting many battles, but if we weren't a people who worshiped and lifted our hands to the throne of God and declared who he was, we would be losing. We are a worshiping church. And I love that, and I know this can be translated uh, differently, but can we put that last verse up there? That just says he lifted his hands to the throne of heaven. I'm sorry, the one back in Exodus. Is the, it was just the very last verse in Exodus and it talks about because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord. Okay, so this is how I picture it. Hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord. When Moses was lifting his hands up, symbolically he was lifting his hands to God. He was lifting his hands up to the throne of the Lord, touching the throne of God, saying, not by might, not by my power, but by you, God. You will win the victory. This is, it was an act of surrender and it was an act of activating heaven to come to earth. So why do we lift our hands in worship when we gather together? Is it because it looks cool or we want to look holy or it's just because what you do at church? No, I believe, I just think that that story and that, that scripture is a prophetic picture of the power of our physical expression unto God in worship. So next time we're worshiping, maybe you've never even lifted your hands up before, but think of this. I'm lifting my hands to the throne of God. I'm touching his throne. I'm saying, God, you are on your throne. You are in control. You have all authority. You all have have all power, and you're activating God to fight on your behalf. And I love this because here's the thought. What if when we come together as a church and worship, when we're worshiping together, lifting our hands together in worship, not only are battles being won in our lives, but all over the world, it's changing the atmosphere and battles are being won. Okay, so Chris and Heidi, right? They're in Africa. There are missionaries in Africa. What if they're just like, going through stuff and despair and, and people are coming against them. What if when, as a church, when we come together and we worship, we are activating heaven to fight on their behalf all the way across the world? Yeah. Here's the point. You just don't know all that is happening when we worship. You don't. We're not just filling 20 minutes of space to sing songs. There is a battle going on. And if you didn't know this, we are in a war, okay? Okay. So we're going to read this verse in Ephesians, and it tells us that we are in a war. It says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is a battle going on for your life right now. 
Our, our fights aren't really with each other. There's a battle in the spiritual forces that's happening. And the Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to kill you. He wants your relationships to fail. But if we are worshipers, that cannot happen. That drives darkness away. When we call on God and when we lift our thrones, our hands to his throne, we are changing the atmosphere. Darkness is running away. Darkness flees. I love this story. It's a really cool story. My friend told me his family is from Korea. And um, they were... Uh, there was a group of missionaries in Korea and they were driving in a bus and their bus broke down in the middle of nowhere. Help was a couple hours out and so they had no other choice but to get out of the bus and worship. And they found a guitar in the bus and they all got out and they just began to sing songs to God and pray and pray for the children of the country and for the orphans. And um, it was a, just a powerful time of worship. Anyway, a couple hours later, they... Uh, someone came and helped them and they made it to their destination and a couple years later some of those same missionaries traveled that same road again and this time when they were traveling the road they got to that very same spot where they had broke down and where they worshiped and at that very same spot there was an orphanage that was built and it wasn't just a regular orphanage it was an orphanage run by Christians and there were many kids in the orphanage under knowing the word of God and being taught the word of God and receiving love from family and you could say man maybe that's a coincidence but I say no that's not a coincidence because you know what in our worship the airwaves are being cleared and we're making space for heaven to come to earth that's what happened they cleared the airwaves they drove out the darkness and it allowed heaven to invade earth Man, God wants to invade this earth. The Bible says pray for his kingdom to come. When we worship, we are bringing down the kingdom of heaven. Battles are being won. And all we're doing is worshiping. We don't have to try so hard. We don't have to fight and struggle. We just got to surrender to God. Lift our hands to his throne. Activate him to fight on our behalf. I love that just want to get to my last point and it's this and this is something I've just really been discovering lately and it's just been amazing and when we worship it affirms who we are okay so this is what happens we worship we bless the father heart of God he soaks in and then he declares it to the nations who he is he fights for us and then he declares over us who we are. He affirms our identity. And even sometimes, you know, I I've, I've tend to think of worship as a sacrifice more, of us giving something to God. But just like in any other relationship, God wants to give back to us. And when we worship, we receive his love through it. And I already said it, but if we are worshiping, we're becoming more like him. So this is the part that's crazy to me that I've been thinking as I've been worshiping God. Imagine as we sing these songs, right? We're singing to God, he is good, he is good, and his love endures. And we're singing he's beautiful, and we're singing he's great, and we're singing he's merciful, and we're singing that he's awesome. But then God sings those same things back to us. You see, because when we worship, we're becoming like him. And so now God is saying, yes, I am those things. I declare those things to the nations. But now you, my son, you, my daughter, are becoming like me. And now you are those things too. Forever you will be faithful. Forever you are strong. You are great. You are full of mercy. You are full of love. Because you're becoming like me. I'm making you like me. Don't you know God wants us to be like him? I can't say that enough. Zephaniah says that God is singing over us. He's rejoicing over us. What a thought. As we sing to him, he's singing those same things over us. I love that. Um, and I'm not saying we'll ever become God, but God tells us that we are to bear his image. My son recently uh, graduated kindergarten this past month, and... 
<laughs> I guess that is an accomplishment, yeah. <laughs> we went to his graduation ceremony and, and uh, you know, they had pictures of all the kids and each kid under their picture said what they wanted to become when they grow up. And, you know, some kids said, I want to be a teacher, I want to be a librarian, I want to be a police officer. And when it got to my son, his picture, it said, I want to be a worship pastor like my dad. <laughs> See, that's good, right? I, I loved it. I mean, I love that. What a great joy and honor it is that my son wants to be like me, that he looks up to me. You know, that's, that's our God. It's his greatest joy for us to become more and more like him. He wants us to think like him. He wants us to act like him. And the way we do that is by delighting in his presence and by worshiping him. And I just got to tell you, God is not angry. <laughs> he is not a mad God. You know, God is in a good mood, okay? <laughs> Some of you really need to hear that and need to believe that. God is in a good mood. He's not an angry God. He's not just looking to zap you at any wrong step you take. That is not our Father's heart. He loves you. He rejoices over you. He dances over you. He sings over you. You are his delight. You are the apple of his eye. He knit you together in your mother's womb. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. He didn't make a mistake. Like he planned you fearfully and wonderfully. He planned you. He knit you together. He, you are his greatest joy. You have to believe that. You know, if my son disobeyed, this is what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't say, apart from me, evildoer. <laughs> okay? <laughs> That'd be weird. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I do when he disobeys? I draw him close to me. I say, buddy, what you did, that is not what walker boys do. That is not who we are. This is what walker boys do in that situation. And that's who you are. And I hug him and I forgive him and I tell him I love him. And I say, okay, now go and be who you really are. And you know what? That's what God does. There's not one of you who has gone too far from God, who has messed up so badly. He draws near to you. And he says, no, that's not who you are. You're a child of God. Let me speak over you who you are. Let me tell you how I've made you, who I've created you to be. I forgive you. I love you. Now go and sin no more and be who you were created to be. See, but we have to worship him because when we worship him, when we draw near to him, then we receive all that he has for us. We bless him. We speak his praises so that he can declare to the nations who he is, so that he can fight on our behalf, and then so that he can sing over us and affirm who we are and tell us that we're just like him and receive his love today. God wants you to receive his love today. You were made to be a worshiper. You were created to worship the almighty God. And our God is love. And everything he does is motivated out of love. So he created you as a worshiper because of love. Because when you become like him, everything else in your life will fall in place. You could be surrounded by many trials, but you will be in the presence and the peace of God that passes all understanding and everything else is gonna be okay when you abide in his presence and when you worship him. Amen? So I just feel like we just need to end worshiping a little bit. This is our chance. Let's sing a new song unto God. Let's declare who he is. Let's activate heaven to fight on our behalf. Let's stand together.